everyone. I'm Matthias Stace, Token Design Lead at Outlier Ventures. And this is the fourth episode of the new Outlier Ventures series, where we are going to cover a range of topics related to token design, such as token economics, mechanism design, and token engineering. Outlier Ventures or I may hold tokens mentioned on this show, but nothing said here constitutes financial advice. So please do your own research before making any investment decisions. And uh, today I'd like to welcome Sam Williams, um, the founder and CEO of Arweave which is a global and permanent hard drive that allows its users to remember and preserve valuable information, apps, and history indefinitely. Um, yeah, very good to have you here, Sam. Thanks for having me. Yeah, one thing I would say is I'm, I'm certainly not the CEO of Arweave, but I, I am the CEO of the founding company of Arweave. Uh, ah, very different. Makes sense. Makes <laughs> <But> sense. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for having me on. So to kick off, uh, can you please tell us about your background, how you ended up founding Arweave and about what Arweave does? Sure. Uh, last first, Arweave is a permanent data storage system at the base layer. So you can think of it essentially as on-chain storage that scales, it's two kind of components of that. One is a mining system that encourages people to uh, create replicas of the data set rather than burning uh, electricity on hashing. And the second component is um, economic, which might be more interesting to us uh, during this show, which is about the endowment structure. Broad principle is when you uh, put data into Arweave, you pay for 200 years worth of storage up front, which is actually fairly cheap. It's about 0 0.4 cents per megabyte. Um, yes, and then over time, the cost of storage declines. And that essentially gives you interest in the form of storage purchasing power uh, on your original, what we call principle that you put aside. And so this typically happens at a rate of around 30.30 0.5% per year. Um, so by the end of the first year, after you've put the tokens into the endowment, you normally end up with about 260 years worth of storage purchasing power. You can kind of see over time that this, uh, this means that you end up with more storage purchase, purchasing power accruing than you're taking in order to pay for storage. Um, lots of components uh, of that we can get into if you want. Um, and also, you know, uh, why we think that, that that pattern will continue for at least 400, 500 years probably actually into the thousands of years but being conservative. Um, yeah, that's a little bit of the background of Awi, what it does. Um, in terms of myself, I, I got into building Awi about four years ago now. Um, while I was doing a, a PhD in distributed operating system design, and we were looking at uh, the state of the world and we, we sort of saw that, let's, to put it politely, I think, uh, we're entering a period where an immutable record of what is happening in the world that is distributed all across the world is probably more relevant and more valuable than it was 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, geopolitical instability is very real right now. Um, same with the, the stability of our democracies. So we figured that the small component that we could try and contribute to solving the problem um, is to at least remember the past in a clear way because that's one of the things that authoritarian regimes like to play with in order to manipulate people's uh, actions in the future. So uh, that's what we said about doing. That was four years ago. We, we launched the network um, nearly three years ago now. Uh, and ever since then, we've just been kind of growing it. Uh, and recently it's, it's caught a really massive gust of uh, wind and, and growth. Um, yeah, it's just been kind of incredible to be part of, frankly. Really cool, really cool. Um, all right, let's get into, get into uh, the token design bit. Uh, can you please tell us more about uh, how the token design is set up, uh, namely the core problem the token is solving, uh, who the different stakeholders are, and uh, what mechanisms uh, are there in the system so that uh, incentives of all these stakeholders are aligned for the kind of uh, the, the benefit of the whole network? Yeah, the, uh, the useful byproduct, we call it. Mm. So in our case, the useful byproduct is uh, permanent storage of the data set. Uh, this, this is, I guess, split into two main stakeholders um, and a third, you could argue, which is the network itself. Um, <laughs> the, the miners are a stakeholder. They don't care about anything other than gaining tokens quickly. Um, and there are stores of data. They obviously just want their data to be uh, replicated indefinitely, if not forever. And in fact, what we define permanence as inside the Arweave team is, is something like uh, <laughs> the data lives longer than the, uh, the last human-like life. 
if we can reach that, we would say we succeeded. Um, and that that covers robots and anything else that ends up running the running the show from here on. Uh, okay, so so how's it work? Um, it's it's pretty simple in terms of flow. Like one buys the token in order to uh, match it with some data that you're trying to store. You submit a transaction header to the network, which is uh, distributed to all of the miners. Uh, the miners then put this into a block, a la Bitcoin, but only about, I think it's 13% uh, approximately, uh, of the uh, transaction fee from that, um, yeah, from the header, from the transaction, uh, is actually given to the miner that creates the block. Instead, the tokens are put into what we call the endowment, which is shared across all of the data set, um, which makes it actually very uh, scalable because you essentially have big O1, right? So you, you you can very easily validate the whole thing. You don't need to maintain different contracts per endowment. So, so you have one large endowment, which everyone is sharing. Um, and then over time, if the, or when the block reward doesn't cover the uh, storage costs for what we call the burden of the network, uh, then we take some tokens from the endowment such that the miners have some level of profit um, in their operations and they're incentivized to store that data. It, is it worth going into like the technical side of how we incentivize them to store the data? Is it best to just stick on the economic side? Um, yeah, let's let's stick uh, to the economic side first, and then maybe mm -hmm. if we have time, we can go into that. Uh, For sure. So and and the um, the total supply of uh, of the AR tokens. It is the AR tokens we are talking about, right? That's yeah. right. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it is it inflationary? Deflationary? Does it stay? Does it stay the same? Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's got a very interesting model from this point of view, actually. So um, yeah, the total supply is 66 million. Uh, there isn't a huge amount for mining rewards. This is because data storage is actually very cheap, uh, particularly relative to the size of the data set that you get when you, you're offering permanent storage, which is fundamentally obviously more expensive than temporary storage. Um, yes, so there's only 11 million tokens or something to be released um, over time. And yeah. It's, it's, it's not exactly deflationary precisely, but there is this component that uh, the endowment will slowly suck up more and more tokens over time. Um, and it will release those tokens over a long enough period of time. So, so not technically deflationary, but for all intents and purposes over the sort of mid term at any point in time, uh, looking forward, then, then there's likely to be fewer tokens in the circulating supply than there are at the current period, uh, just because as people use it, more tokens get stored into the endowment. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also pretty elastic. So in the situation where, for example, I know uh, storage costs were to rise, which is very, very rare, but has happened once after a tsunami, I think in 2011 or 12, uh, there, was a, there was a period where basically knocked out of the hard drive or about 40%, if I remember correctly, of the hard drive production for a year. Um, yeah, so so there was a spike uh, in hard drive prices rather than declining, which is sort of the rate or, or, or the uh, pattern that we've seen over a very long period now. Um, yes, yeah, so if that were to happen, then the network can adjust and actually take more tokens from the endowment for that short period. And then obviously there's a huge um, safety margin that we built into the network. It's actually like 61 fold, uh, lower expectation of declining storage costs than the actual storage uh, decline, uh, storage cost decline over the last 50 years. Um, so, so you would assume that some of those tokens would simply never leave the endowment, but they're always there to take from the endowment in the case where, uh, you know, something were to happen and, and, and that would be an appropriate use of them. That's very interesting. Okay, so so basically, the endowment is the mechanism that makes sure that uh, that uh, the circulating supply of uh, of uh, the AR tokens is kind of kept in check, so that there is not too much sell pressure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, partially, I mean, mm -hmm. it's really just there to make sure that we are only releasing tokens um, to pay for storage, and everything else that the tokens should just accrue. Um, mm -hmm. Mm, yeah, it's, it's 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 very simple and seems to be working. Yeah, okay, that's that's very cool. And uh, yeah, um, can you please tell us more about the proof of access uh, mechanism? Uh, yeah, absolutely. That you're using. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so it's not really proof of access anymore. It <laughs> it started as proof of access, and then it became succinct proofs of access, and then it became succinct proofs of random access. 
Um, but these evolutions, as we uh, unfortunately add letters to the acronym, <laughs> but um, the evolutions make the algorithm a little better each time. So the current system basically works like this. Um, you have like a proof of work sandwich, we call it. So there's a small hash at the beginning, like a fairly short hash. And you take obviously the block data segment that you're looking to mine into a block and the nonce that you've created, and then you get this output of the hash. And then you interpret this as a number and you modulo this against the height of the network. Oh, sorry, not the height of the network, the, the weave size of the network, we call it. But you can think of it, I guess, it's just like, the amount of data stored in the network. And that chooses a challenge byte from the data set. And then you just need to go and recall that byte. So get it from disk um, and yes, you recall it and uh, you get the proof along with it so that anyone that looks at it can say, hey, I know that this is actually the thing that's at that location in the network. And then you hash that and you see if the output of this uh, passes the difficulty in a typical sort of proof of work manner, uh, mm -hmm. similar to what you would see in Bitcoin. And obviously in almost every case, apart from actually obviously once every two minutes, um, this is not true. And so you just try again over and over and over again. And this means that when someone presents you with a, um, a result of one of these spores and it has a certain difficulty, you can, you can sort of extrapolate that that person has done a huge amount of work where they've been validating the integrity of the data set which they've had to replicate um, in order to take part. And then another component of that is you can also validate that for every joule spent on CPU work, some proportionate quantity has been spent on storing and replicating the data. So obviously the way that this works is you're basically hammering the, the typically people use SSDs, uh, but the, the disk of whatever form you've got um, and the latency or not really the latency, but actually the bandwidth of the connection between the CPU and the drive defines your hash rate. Um, and so you can obviously just like max that out and then you need to buy a new drive and also make a new replica of the data set on that drive. So if you want to scale it, you essentially have to just scale the number of replicas of the uh, network that you're creating. Okay, that makes sense. And, and how, how um, energy intensive is it this mechanism? Right. Uh, less so than normal proof of work. Um, but we're always working to try and like minimize the amount of work that really is hashing rather than uh, drives. I mean, there's a real promise in, in uh, hard drive related mining that, yeah, we should be able to get this to be very energy efficient because hard drives, particularly SSDs, they don't take any more power to, um, to be reading from them at maximum capacity or maximum uh, uh, speed than they do just to sit idly more or less. It's like you know, maybe a watt per hour or something. Um, really not very much at all. So, so that's pretty cool relative to what we have with Bitcoin mining, of course, which is very energy intensive. Um, we're still polishing, I think like making it so that we're minimizing the amount of energy that's expended on the hashing component to generate for example, that random part of the network and, and also to then validate against that difficulty. Um, there's still a little bit of work to be done there to really optimize that so that it's just, um, yeah, essentially green work, if you will, which is not really causing very much harm to the environment. But frankly, I also think there's, there's other components here we've got to take into account. <clears throat> this is like people saying early Teslas were very energy efficient and it's like, yeah, that, that may be true once you've built the Tesla, right? <laughs> but you have to go through this process where you, where you create the thing. And that creates, or at least in the early stages, from what I understand, there, there was lots of dubious um, environmental byproduct, which is not what you want. So you've also got to take this into account, like when you're building you know, SSDs and the like, what actually goes into creating an SSD? Not necessarily a super environmentally friendly process. But I think this can be said for basically every sure. proof of work blockchain. So I, I think, um, yeah, I think it's definitely a step in the right direction uh, to go towards disk space as mining. That's really good. Um, and in this case, it's doing something really valuable, which is just making lots and lots of replicas of a valuable data set. So it's, it's a very useful proof of work in that regard, um, unlike, you know, Bitcoin. Uh, but yeah, yeah I yeah. think there's still improvements to be made here. And I, and I also think that there's, 
there's questions around proof of stake still, how that will play out in practice. Like the theory was that, you know, we would put the, the networks in the hands of, of people that have a uh, vested stake in its long-term success. Sounds great in, pra in principle, but like in practice, it's just not how it works. What happens instead is everyone leaves their tokens on Coinbase or Binance. And now Coinbase and Binance are the, uh, you know, the leading stakers in the network. So they just decide what happens on the network, which is not really optimal. And of course, those services can essentially make it so that um, by kind of like rotating tokens in and out, uh, you can take part in staking without actually having to stake. Um, yeah, so I, I would say the model is largely broken um, now. It doesn't really do what we set out to achieve in that regard. So I think yeah. there's a lot of work to be done there. I mean, frankly, there's a lot of new work to be done on all proofs of X in blockchain, like proof of stake, a little bit disappointing in practice. Uh, proof of work, you know, obvious environmental impact is not great. Um, yeah, there's there's clear work to be done here in the industry. I think. Yeah, yeah, those are those are very good points. Well, let's hope let's 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 see if proof of access can can conquer the world. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be cool. Uh, okay, uh, can you please tell us uh, how profit sharing tokens uh, work in your network and why there is the need for an additional token on top of uh, AR? Yeah, well, it's not really a an additional token. It's more that um, okay two components of this. Mm -hmm. So profit sharing tokens exist in this thing we call SmartWeave, which is just a smart contracting system built on top of the network, uh, making use of the fact that essentially if you have permanent information storage, you can lazily evaluate smart contracts on top, um, which turns out is super efficient relative to the old um, smart contract blockchain systems, uh, where essentially every single node has to run every single piece of compute. Now with a lazily evaluated system, you just write the inputs to the contract into the network, and then you execute them client side. Um, and that means that they can do arbitrary amounts of compute. The security model is different. Um, so they can actually be written like in whatever language you want, doing whatever you want to the machine of the person running them. Like it's the kind of closer to the relationship of um, developer and user in a you know desktop operating system. I just download the program if I trust you and I run it and see what happens relative to in the smart contract world, traditionally, you would have this system whereby um, the validators needed to run the program on behalf of the users. And so the validators maybe didn't trust the developer. And, and so now the security model has to be very, very different. So, so lazily evaluated um, smart contracting systems are really powerful like that. Um, on top of that, people started playing around with these things we now call profit sharing tokens, but they started with just like, normal tokens, like, hey, isn't it interesting you can kind of print a token on this thing? But then we realized, well, actually, that is quite interesting because the thing that the we've exposes is this permanent decentralized web. So all this information that's available inside it is available to web browsers. And they will render just like a normal web page or an asset of any other kind uh, in a browser. That's pretty interesting because it means you can build fully decentralized and autonomous web services. So. Um, while in Ethereum land, you know, everyone cares about programming money, we think that there's actually huge space to decentralize ownership and uh, responsibility and um, control, really, in the web services that we use on a day to day basis. So you can think of a decentralized Facebook, for example, where the Facebook corporation doesn't get to control everything. Actually, everything is permanent. If you can use it one way today, you can be sure that you'll be able to use it that way or better in the future if they release a new version or someone releases an improved version. So you have these web applications and you can have these tokens inside SmartWeave, which is running in this lazily evaluated way. Um, we started to realize that actually you can just distribute a tip when a user interacts with, um, yeah, with a web service. So for example, if they upload a blog post to a medium-like system or if they, you know, change their profile picture on a decentralized Facebook. You can generate a tip every time they do this and you can distribute it relative to the ownership share of a token. And it, when you do this, you've, you've essentially created a profit stream, which is tokenized. Now you can buy and sell the futures of the uh, value that will accrue along that profit stream. So that's where profit sharing tokens came from originally. Uh, and then 
it was like um, one or two months after that, the community came up with this idea uh, that we ended up calling profit sharing communities, which the Arweave community ended up coming up with this idea, which we call profit sharing communities, which live on top of the network. Um, and the basic idea here is that we we mix a DAO into that token structure uh, with a few a few different interesting mechanisms we might actually want to talk about. Um, but broad principle is now you have decentralized autonomous web services that are operated by a community governed DAO and everything inside them is uh, decentralized and owned by that community. So that's a really effective uh, way of doing things it turns out. And now there's like 30 or 40, maybe, maybe even more of these profit sharing communities out there. Um, many of which have raised capital and are building very serious projects at this point. And that, that mm -hmm. only got started like five or six months ago. But yeah, so, so those founders are obviously minting their own tokens it, um, because they're creating value streams that uh, well, they, they own. Uh, and so they're just representing access to that value stream from the application that they're building uh, in a token that other people can buy. And then also that token that you take part in governance, typically. I mean, Mm -hmm. That's so, kind so of the. To, 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 to make sure I understand, uh, yeah. so it's a it's a token on top of our weave, that mm -hmm. uh, yeah. kind of like ERC twenty. What, what ERC twenty is to Ethereum, uh, that can be minted, uh, can be created by 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 people or by by entities by users uh, who are using our weave, and they can encode some kind of logic into it that when certain stuff happens. Uh, holders of these profit sharing fair sharing tokens will 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 get um, no sorry certain addresses will will be rewarded with this profit sharing tokens no, if, if certain no, no. It's okay just, I own the token so you and I own mm -hmm. fifty percent of a, uh, one of these profit sharing tokens uh, or of the total supply of a profit sharing token mm -hmm. and um, someone uses an application fifty percent of the time I will get a tip in our weave tokens sometimes, but also potentially in some other kind of value unit. Actually, there are some profit sharing tokens that receive um, tips in Ethereum, actually. Uh, yes, so so I'll receive it 50% of the time and you will 50% of the time. And so kind of averages out to our ownership share, um, but without actually having to do some heavy computation uh, and work out, you know, like one distribution per owner of the token for mm -hmm. every interaction, which would obviously be a lot of compute. You can just be stochastic about it and get it to average out to the right quantities. Oh, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. So it's not an additional token in the RWV ecosystem. It's more like a yeah, yeah, okay. It's like a token well, it's standard. A, mm -hmm. It yeah, exactly. It's a token standard, um, which people use to to mint tokens, which represent uh, ownership in revenue streams of basically all kinds. So I only spoke about you know the revenue streams from applications, but Actually, to add to the complexity, um, people are starting to mint profit sharing tokens inside the application. So for example, there's like a band camp like uh, platform inside the Arweave network and they have albums and those albums can have profit sharing tokens that are attached to them. And then you can buy and sell access to the profit from just that album if you want to. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then obviously, of course, on top of that, there's the platform profit sharing uh, community and you can buy and sell access to all of the profit created uh, by the platform as well. Makes sense. Makes sense. All right. We are running out of time, I think. Uh, that's it for today. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sam, for coming in. And uh, yeah, we hope to have you here again soon. Thanks for having me on. Outlier Ventures has been investing and accelerating the Web3 ecosystem since 2013. In 2019, we launched Basecamp an accelerator program for pre-seed startups operating in DeFi, NFTs, and open data. We'll provide you with capital, help you with your token design, give access to our network of the best investors and founders of Web3, as well as back office support and mentorship. So if you're a Web3 founder, be sure to check it out. Um, the applications are now open.